morning stars they wept The morning sun was dead The savior of the world was fallen His body on the cross His blood poured out for us The weight of every curse upon him Easter celebration 
Uh, those that of you that are joining online, we welcome you as well. And uh, you are part of our family is just like you were sitting right here. Now, Easter, I'm sure we all have some good memories. And sometimes there are certain things that stood out um, in your childhood, maybe for memories. And I love to go Easter egg hunting. If you're with me, how many of you guys love to hunt Easter eggs? Oh, yeah. Okay. Now, when I was little, you know, I got the concept pretty quick. You go out, you find the eggs. Now, we used to, we didn't have so many, uh, many plastic eggs to hunt. My mom would actually, we would dye the eggs and then, you know, hide them. And then I would collect them all. Well, I was probably like seven or eight years old. And I thought, well, I went out Easter egg hunting, found all the Easter eggs. And a couple days later, I'm in my yard. And I look, and my dad had some stacks of wood that was on like this metal, metal shelf. And it was up on cement blocks. And I happened to look underneath there, and there is three eggs. I miss three eggs. I'm like... What? How did I miss three Easter eggs? Not thinking that they were all white. But I was like, these eggs, I found them. They're awesome. They're going to be good. So I reach in there and I grab the eggs. And when I did, all of a sudden, I felt this sharp pain on my side. They were duck eggs. And Mama Duck was watching me. And she decided to peck my side and my head and everything else. And I went running back to the house, screaming like, I mean, I was in pain. I was scared. This duck is chasing me, flapping its wings, all because I was trying to get the duck eggs. So a warning. Make sure that after Easter, unless they're colored, don't mess with the eggs, okay? <laughs> You'll get hurt. But Easter is a time of year when we celebrate the completion of God's redemption, his plan to rescue all the people. Uh, it was passed down from the beginning when there was sin in the Garden of Eden. God had a plan of redemption. We read the Garden of Eden where, you know, Adam and Eve were in the garden. They get banned from the garden. And then... There's this whole time where people are waiting and they're hoping and they're believing that there's, they're going to be rescued. We see this when the Israelites are in Egypt and God is, is saying, I'm bringing you a promise. Well, they were going to get the promised land, but there was more to it. And they kept believing and waiting and hoping. How many of you have ever waited on something and you felt like it was way too long. You waited. You waited maybe for a, a certain job position. You maybe waited for, um, you know, to have children. You waited, you waited, and you waited, and you're finally like, I'm tired of waiting. But you're still believing that something's going to come through. You're going to see breakthrough. Maybe you're waiting on financial breakthrough. Maybe you're waiting on, you know, to get married. Whatever it is, sometimes you're just waiting and you feel like, is it ever going to come? Well, throughout history, we see that people were just waiting on the Messiah. And he finally comes and the people, most people, did not recognize him. They didn't realize that God's promise was standing right before them. All four Gospels give an account of the resurrection of Jesus. And yes, there are a few differences, but it's the same historical event, the same story of Jesus' death and resurrection, the same outcome, just slightly different details because you have four different authors, so everyone's perception is going to be a little bit different. If you watch a football game, depending on what team you like, you're going to get a different perspective of someone's view of that game. The refs call a bad play. That's why the other team won, right? There's always a different perspective. You ask anybody, right? You ask some people, how was traffic today? Oh, it was terrible. Then you got other people, eh, 
I just ran all through the red lights. I'm good. Right? <laughs> just a, your perspective, right? Don't do that. I don't encourage that. Okay? <laughs> but different perspective. Today, I'm going to look at one particular man that played a significant part in the end of Jesus' earthly life. If you would, turn with me to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. If you would stand with me for the honor and reading of God's word. It says, while Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message. Okay, we're going to stop right there for a second. His wife sent him a message. You'd think that Pilate would be paying attention. Okay? Right there is a sign. His wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with the innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. She's warning Pilate, don't have anything to do with Jesus in this trial. But the chief priests and the elders pursued or persuaded the crowd to ask for uh, Barabbas. And to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. For Rabbis, they answered. What shall I do then Jesus, with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. And he answered them, crucify him. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. Why do you, uh, then they shouted louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that intended, uh, or instead of an uproar, was starting, or was starting, he took, uh, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I'm innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered. Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. You may be seated. One man had the authority to release Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I've made a mistake, I'm looking for mercy. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And it was an opportunity for someone to give mercy and release him. Pilate was confused. Pilate was, have you ever had a decision to make and you're just back and forth? You don't know what to do? That was Pilate. Pilate was confused. He was persuaded by the crowd. I'm going to ask today that you would open up your hearts and your minds to... Receive his word because sometimes, guess what? We're confused. We're, we look one way and then we act another. Should I do this or that? Should I take this job? Shouldn't I? Should I date this person or shouldn't I? Should I marry this person or shouldn't I? Should I? There's always these decisions. And Pilate was here at the judge's seat. And he didn't know what to do. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad I wasn't Pilate. Right? And turn to your other neighbor, another, other neighbor and say, I'm glad you're not Pilate. Right? Pilate washed his hands of, the, of the Jesus with the crowd. He's saying, I don't want anything to do with this. It's on you. Now, I don't know about you, but soap is the most... Uh, accessible commodity in the world. However, no matter what you do, no matter what substance, no matter how much you scrub, guess what? It doesn't cleanse your soul. You can clean the outside of you. You ever seen people that, oh, they dress sharp, they look good, right? But then they speak. And then you hear what comes out of their heart. You hear what comes out of their mind. A lot of them don't have filter, right? And then you're like, okay, they don't look as presentable as they look on the outside because of what's on the inside. 
Well, Pilate said, I'm washing my hands of this whole situation. Before we get the full concept of Easter, we have to understand the turn of events that preceded the cross. The turmoil that was going on the inside of the people in Jerusalem. It just wasn't Pilate. It was the people in Jerusalem. They were there for the Passover feast. It was supposed to be a happy time. Remember the week before? Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. Palm Sunday. Everybody's excited. There's a big street party. Jesus is here. Jesus is here. And how things shifted and changed. Maybe Jesus went into the temple one too many times and flipped over the wrong table. <laughs> Something happened. There was a shift because the people were like, oh, praise the Lord, crucify him. We talked about last week the fickle crowd. Was this the same crowd that was, that was honoring him? And less than a week later, they were saying crucify him. Scripture doesn't tell us if it was the same crowd, but how many times have we been fickle ourselves? We act one way, we say one thing, we turn, and we act and say something different. The people in Jerusalem were just this way. They were happy. There was a lot of things going on, but there was a lot of people that were opposing Jesus. There was a lot of people, the religious leaders at the time, they were kind of caught in the middle themselves. Did they believe he was the Messiah? Maybe. But they didn't know. There was a struggle from right or wrong. There was a struggle of what are we going to believe? Do we believe that he is the Messiah? We know God's word says that he comes. But then they struggled to actually believe the man that was standing in front of them. They were caught in the middle. Some neither believed that he was, or believed that uh, Jesus was the Messiah. Some struggled. Some discounted his authority. Some didn't even know what to think. They had heard that he was a miracle-working Messiah, that he was the Son of God, that he performed miracles, that he fed the five thousand, he multiplied the bread and the fish. There was other ones that they didn't know what to believe. We seen last week where they were honoring him and waving the palm branches and <laughs> laying their coats down. But in the same breath, they were like, what's going on? The crowd. This crowd was turning into a riot. If Pilate said the wrong word, they were going to destroy the town. So Pilate's like, well, I want to stay governor. If I say the wrong words, there's going to be a riot, and then I'm going to lose my position. Basically, that's what was going on with Pilate. He was like, I need to take care of myself. I need to take care of the, the city of Jerusalem. If I say the wrong thing, I'm out. And so... Majority rules with the, with the crowd. He's like, I'm going to make the crowd happy, even if it's wrong, because I want to keep my position. You ever had those days when you had a big decision to make? Maybe you had those days where you were on the mountaintop, right? Things were going good. You thought, man, what could go wrong? You ever say that? And then all of a sudden... The car breaks down, you get a flat tire, you get a phone call, things happen, you're just like, okay, this is not good, right? It's like praying for patience. Never pray for patience because you're going to be tested. <laughs> Same thing here. Same thing was going on. They were on a mountaintop. It was, the, it was the Passover feast. Everybody was in a joyous mood, a happy mood. And then things changed. Some of you are only happy if you can get through the week. Maybe it's because you're trying to just get through that job that you really don't like. Some of you, maybe you're like, if I can just get through this job without taking the copier and smashing it with a hammer or my computer, I'm going to be happy. That's going to be a good week for me. Some of you may be like, you know what, if I don't have car issues or some appliance doesn't break down in my house, or I have an unexpected expense, 
then that's a good week. Some of you are praying that you just don't get a phone call from your school for your kids. Hey, they're acting a fool, right? You're just hoping and praying that you can get through the week. Some of you are like, if illness and sickness stays away from my house, I'm good. And then some of you might be like me. And I'm just like, if I can go to the grocery store and get out of there without taking a second mortgage on my house, it's a good week, right? Whatever it is, some of us just try to get through the week. The people in Jerusalem were just trying to get through Passover so they could return home. And then we see all the things that were going on. Seriously, though, when life is going good, guess what? There's an adversary, the devil, that's going to mess things up. Now, I'm not saying that every time you get a flat tire that the devil is attacking you, okay? That's called a nail in your tire, all right? Make sure that you don't give the devil too much credit. But what happened? What was going on? The scene in Jerusalem, I mean, the disciples were following Jesus. After the Last Supper, we see that Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes there to pray. And then he knew what was about to happen. He knew that his hour was near and that people had already betrayed him. That Judas had already gotten silver as he betrayed him. His arrest was coming. His beating was coming. Eventually his crucifixion for the sins of the world was coming. The weight of the world was so heavy that no mere man could handle it. But Jesus did the Bible says in Luke twenty-two forty-four, 44, it says, Being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been stressed before, but I have never sweat blood. The hematohydrosis, okay, is a very rare condition in which an individual sweats blood. It may occur when an individual is suffering from extreme levels of stress. Your kids might stress you out, but I don't think they're going to stress you out enough to sweat blood. We have to realize what was going on even for Jesus, the Son of God, the stress level that he was under. Matthew gives us an overview of the governor, Pilate. But the scripture of John shed some light on what was really going on inside Pilate. Remember, he was a man of position. He was a man of authority. He was a man that sentenced Jesus to death to please a crowd just to keep his position. I don't know about you, but sometimes we struggle on, we know what's right, but we struggle because we want to be people pleasers. Or... We, we know what's right, but we do this because it's the right thing to do. And culture says this is what you should do. This is how you should act. We struggle sometimes. Things quickly change, and it was an emotional roller coaster going on at this time in the city of Jerusalem. It represents life and what's going on in the world today. Things change. How many times do you know that, hey, there can be a celebrity that's on high and they say one wrong thing on social media and they lose contracts, they lose money, they lose all kinds of things. Things change very quickly in our world today. This past weekend, we, were, we had a church booth at the Kids Fair. There were several people dressed up in costumes and interacting with those families and those kids. And one character stood out to me. It was a young lady dressed as Sadness from the Disney movie Inside Out. And I don't know about you, but you ever know people that just, they just walk around gloomy? They just walk around sad. You ask them how they're doing, and they're just like, oh. They almost walk around like Eeyore. When I think of sadness, I think of Eeyore, right? He just walks around, how you doing, Eeyore? I'm okay. That's sadness. She's just sad about everything, right? The whole premise of the movie is Riley, a happy 11-year-old that loves hockey, 
right? Her world was turned upside down and inside out when she and her parents moved across country. Riley's emotions, led by joy, try to guide her through this difficult time, this life-changing event. However, the stress of the move brings sadness to the forefront. When joy and sadness are inadvertently swept into the far reaches of Riley's mind, the only emotions left in headquarters are anger, fear, and disgust. Now, if you've ever watched that movie, okay, it holds a lot of truth to what goes on up here, right? But if we look at what goes on and what happened to Jesus, we see all these emotions play out. Every one of them. When you read the arrest, the torture, and the death on the cross, and the burial in the tomb, one cannot help but feel all these emotions. If you are a witness to what was going on in the city of Jerusalem at this time, you would have to feel all these emotions. If not, I believe that you are already dead. Okay? Because you would have to feel something if you were witnessing this. If you were to turn with me to the Gospel of John, and let's look at Pilate's plight. John chapter 18, verse 28 through 33. It says, By now it was early morning, and to avoid uh, ceremonial uncleanliness, it says they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Well, how nice of the crowd. They were thinking about themselves, right? <laughs> They wanted, they wanted to go to Chick-fil-A. So they were like, hey, we got We can't. We can't do that. Right? Remember, this was on Friday, so Chick-fil-A was open. Okay? <laughs> yeah. It says, so Pilate came uh, out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If you were not a criminal, they replied. If you were not a criminal, they replied, uh, we would have not handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace and summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Pilate was questioning Jesus and he was questioning the crowd. He was going, he was inside the palace, then he was outside the palace. He was inside the palace, he was outside the palace. You ever know those people that they just can't make a decision? They're, just, they're over here, they're with the crowd. And then all of a sudden, they're over here. This was Pilate. A lot was going on in this man's mind. Pilate was questioning the crowd, then he was questioning Jesus. He was battling on the inside, knowing what to believe, even if he already knew the truth. He knew that this man was innocent. He even got a note from his wife that this man was innocent. And he didn't listen. Fellas, I'm telling you now, if your significant other gives you a note, pay attention. This will get you in trouble. Right? Pilate tried to wash his hands of the responsibility of the rejection of Jesus Christ. He's like, if I can just wash my hands, then they won't be stained. If I can wash my hands, then it's somebody else's responsibility. If you wash your hands of something that you previously had responsibility for, it says that you're basically intentionally stopping. You're intentionally stopping. You don't want to do anything. Now, if you did that at your work, place of employment, you said, hey, you know what? Mm, I don't think that's my responsibility, boss. How's that going to go for you? Not too well, right? Because, why? Because you have responsibilities that you are being paid for. And God had the same thing going on. He, he had responsibilities. Pilate was put in a position, and he had authority. Yet, he's like, nope, I'm done. I'm not going to be in trouble because I wash my hands. Like I said before, I don't care how many times you wash your hands. You're not washing your soul. Maybe 
We wash our hands of certain things because of hurt, past hurt. Maybe we wash our hands of certain things because, you know what, we're just like, it's easier just to ignore it. Maybe we wash our hands of people because, you know, instead of really talking things through and reconciling with them, it's just easier to push them away. Maybe we are not careful enough when we make a decision because it's just easier to walk away from something instead of responsibilities. Jeremiah 2.22 says, Although you wash your hands, or you wash yourself with soap and use an abundant of cleansing powder, the stains on, of your guilt is still before me, declares the Lord. We can wash all we want. We're still dirty. There are certain things that are going to be stained. There are certain things going to be you can scrub until you, you scrub your skin off. You're still not going to be clean. Had we witnessed the events that was going on with the betrayal of, of Judas, the arrest of Jesus, how the crowd of the ignorance, how could they justify those actions? How Pilate had the authority, found no criminal charges against Jesus, yet he still condemned him. Maybe it's uh, critical that you see Peter's denial, not once, not twice, but three times. Everything that was going on there, Peter, Peter denies Jesus, the beating that was happening, the arrest itself, that right there would put fear into you. That's why Peter denied Jesus three times, even though he was a follower, even though he was a disciple, because he's seen the beating of Jesus taking place, and the little girl comes up and says, hey, aren't you one of them? And Peter's like, nope, I ain't nothing to do with that. Why? Fear took over. We look at Peter, and no one should cast a stone at Peter and say, man, I would never do that. Because remember, Peter said he would never deny Jesus, yet he did. Fear had gripped him. Disgust would be inevitable if you watched Jesus and his flesh being ripped from his body. One would be disgusted when he was nailed to the cross. As the blood trickles down from his head, from the beatings and from the crown of thorns. When he's labored breathing, one would have to be disgusted with what was going on. Here's the Messiah, here's the teacher, here's the person I've been following, and here he is dying on the cross. One would have to be disgusted with what they saw. As his mother watches... From the foot of the cross, as the soldiers gamble for his clothing, one would have to be disgusted at what was happening. If we witnessed this, how would you feel? These actions were not only to humiliate him as he was nailed to the cross naked, but they were also a display for others. It was a fear factor. If we do this, in this movement of God, this kingdom of God that this man has been teaching, it'll disperse, it'll disappear, it'll go away because everyone, we're going to put fear into everyone. If we kill Jesus, it goes away. No matter how inhumane, no matter how graphic, no matter how bad it is, if we kill him, it goes away. They erected that sign, King of the Jews, over his head. It was humiliation. It was disgusting. If you witness these things, you would have to be disgusted. As he took his last breath and was later moved to the tree, the cross, sadness, had a, sadness and fear had a grip. Had a grip not only his family, his friends, his followers, those 11 disciples, they were left without a leader. They didn't have anybody else, any other direction. We've been following. Remember, they, they dropped their nets. They, they left their life to follow Jesus, to be taught by him, and all of a sudden, he's gone. 
Sadness and fear had gripped them too. They didn't know what to do. Remember that when he broke bread with them and he says, I am going to sacrifice my body. This is my body. And he breaks the bread. And he says, drink from this cup. This is my blood I'm about to pour out to you. They didn't understand that until they actually seen what was going on at the cross. As he took his last breath, one would have to say that this shouldn't be. Because he's the son of God. He's the little baby in a manger that grew up. He's the one that had favor on him. He's the one that multiplied the bread. He's the one that walked on water. He's the one that all he had to do was speak and the sick in another town were healed. Remember the woman with the issue of blood who was so desperate and she was trying to fight through the crowd just to touch him and all she could do is reach under and touch the hem of his garment and instantly the issue of blood for 12 years she was healed. All of this, and the disciples and the followers are like, what? We've seen all these miracles. He healed the blind. He spoke. He touched the, the tongue of the deaf and the mute in their ears, and they opened up. And all this is gone? Fear and sadness had set in. He was the, the man that called Lazarus out of the grave, the dead man. You know, Lazarus, his friend. After a couple days, the body starts to stink. Mary and Martha, his sisters, they called for Jesus. Lazarus is sick, but he was delayed. Why was he delayed? If he loved Lazarus so much, why is he delayed? If he loves me so much... Why is what I pray for delayed? The thing I'm waiting for, hoping for, why is it delayed? Because God gets the glory when things are resurrected. When things are dead and we don't think things are going to go through and work out the way they are. And God says, nope, I got something better. I got something good. Something's going to have to die and start to stink a little bit. You're going to be like, yeah, this really stinks. The situation I'm in really stinks. But guess what? God gets the glory when he calls the dead out of the grave. When you go through a situation you don't think things are going to work out, and then all of a sudden they do, give God the glory because that's the only way it happened. There was this time where they looked at each other and said, hey, we might have to go back to catching fish. I mean, the disciples didn't know what to do. Their leader was gone. Even though Jesus had warned them that the end was coming, they still didn't see it. They couldn't accept it. Or maybe they just plain denied it. Have you ever denied something? You just started denying it so much that you just started believing it? Maybe that's where they were at. Jesus was already gone. He's died. He's in the tomb. Sometimes we struggle with reality and no different than those disciples and followers of Jesus then. Those emotional waves that we all go through. Maybe it was anger. Maybe some of them were just so angry that they just didn't know what to do. I'm just going to go back to fishing. I'm so mad right now, I don't know what to do. I'm just going to go do this. I'm so mad right now because the situation didn't turn out the way I thought that I'm just going to go hide. I'm going to go crawl under a rock and maybe things will get better. You know, you ever ask yourself sometimes, you're like, you're just having a bad day, bad week, whatever. It's like, I just need to go to sleep and hopefully when I wake up, things will change. That's what the disciples were probably hoping. That this was just a nightmare. That they would just go to sleep and they'd wake up and Jesus would be there. Because what else were they going to do? They had seen their father or their leader die on the cross. 
In Luke chapter 24, verse 1 through 8, it says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices, they were prepared, and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but they, when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on what? The third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. How many times have we heard good advice, sound judgment, and then guess what? We ignore it. We don't. We forget it. It's not that we're bad. We just forget. How many times you tell your your kids to do something and oh they inadvertently forget, right? They have selective hearing, right? It starts when you're a teenager, right? And it gets it progresses. For guys, I don't think our selective hearing ever corrects itself, right? Because why? Because we only hear what we want to hear. We a lot of some people have a hard time with correction. Some people have a hard time with reality. Some people have a hard time with the facts and the truth. What happens is you have people that are like Pilate. They wash their hands with situations because that's the only way they know how to react. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to correct it. I don't know how to talk to this person about this tough situation. So what do I do? I ignore it. Well, if you ignore it, what happens? Does it go away? Most of the time, not. Right? If I get a flat tire on my on my car, I can stand there all day long and just look at it. Going, wow, I wish I didn't have a nail in my tire. I wish that something would change. I wish some angel would just come down and just miraculously fill that hole and pump up the tire so I could just keep on driving. Chances are that's probably not going to happen. Could it happen? Yes. But if we are relying on that, we're missing out on a lot of things because we're just standing around looking at flat tires. We're standing around looking at things, hoping that they change. Right? We're standing around looking at the wrong things. We wash our hands sometimes of Jesus because we've been hurt by people. We've been hurt by the church. We've been hurt by things. Maybe we grew up and we look at certain situations and we're like, well, that wasn't, that wasn't fair to me. Now, I'm not discounting any of that. But what I'm saying is sometimes we don't get over that. We keep what? We keep looking for an excuse. We keep looking for things that we know the truth. Only Jesus can wash our sins, no matter how much we try to push him away. The religious leaders and the Sadducees back then, they just tried to push Jesus away. If we get rid of him, then we won't have to face the truth. If we get rid of him, then we'll, then we'll look better. That's exactly what they were doing. We should be rejoicing and celebrating the empty tomb, just like they were. They were excited, right? The empty tomb. It was talked about. First Peter 1, 3, uh, 3 through 4 says, Praise be the, to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and in his great mercy, he was given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into his inheritance, 
that can never perish, spoil, or fade. You would stand with me. The tomb is empty, and we got to be celebrating that. Yes, it was a horrific death. Yes, Jesus died on the cross. Yes, Pilate washed his hands of the whole situation. But when it comes down to it, all that was prophesied about. That Jesus would go to the cross for our sins. That there would be redemption. Remember the redemption that God put in order right from the Garden of Eden. That somehow, some way, he was going to make a way. It was God's plan. The tomb is empty. Death has been defeated. And he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They thought that they would make fun of him. Saying, oh, you're the king of the Jews. Oh, you're this, you're that. Yeah, good teacher. They were always trying to trick Jesus. And Jesus was always one step ahead of them. Why? Because he already knew what they were thinking. He knew that they didn't believe he was the son of God. They knew that they didn't believe, he, they didn't believe that he was the Messiah. He knew that they didn't believe that he was the one that was coming to take care of all of our sin, all of our pain, all of our suffering, all of our healing from the cross. He knew that they didn't believe that, even though they were religious leaders. If you're here today or you're watching online, you say, you know what? I've been doing this my whole life. I've been pushing Jesus away because I'm I don't want to face the truth. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's one way that we can celebrate, one way that we can rejoice in the empty tomb, and that's to give Jesus a chance in your life. If you would, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, those that are watching online, all you have to do is say this very simple prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, I believe. That Jesus Christ, the one and only Son of God, died on the cross for my sins. That on the third day, he rose from that grave and is alive today. That the tomb is empty. And I rejoice in that. That I have a chance for eternal life. Lord, I ask you into my heart. I ask you into my life. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Now, if you said that very simple prayer, heaven is celebrating and so are we. If you would, contact us at email below and let us know that you made that decision today because it is the best decision of your life. We can celebrate, we can rejoice, knowing that the tomb is empty and it was empty for you. Amen? Let's give God a hand clap of praise.